Facebook's open source projects include React, GraphQL, and Cassandra. These projects are key pieces of infrastructure used by thousands of developers, including engineers at Facebook itself. These projects are able to gain traction because Facebook takes the time to decouple the projects from its internal infrastructure and clean up the code before releasing these projects into the wild. Facebook has high standards for what they are willing to release. Tom Okino manages the React team at Facebook, and he works closely with engineers to determine what projects make sense to open source. In this episode, Preeti Kasireddy interviews Tom about how Facebook thinks about open source, what went right with React, why it makes sense for Facebook to continue to release new open source projects, and how full-time employees at Facebook interact with that open source code base. We'd love to get your feedback on Software Engineering Daily. Please fill out the listener survey, available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash survey. Also, Software Engineering Daily is having our third meetup, Wednesday, May 3rd at Galvanize in San Francisco. The theme of this meetup is fraud and risk in software. We're going to have great food, engaging speakers, and a friendly intellectual atmosphere. To find out more, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash meetup. Now let's get to this episode. For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive, but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you can forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash sedaily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three-node replica set. No credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us. I'm really excited to have Tom Mokino on the show today. So Tom Mokino is, he manages the React team at Facebook and is very, very involved in the open source involvement within Facebook. So we're going to be focusing on talking about how open source works within the Facebook organization. But before getting started, I'd love to just have Tom kind of jump in and give a quick introduction of himself. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to chat with you. Just a little bit about myself. I've been here at Facebook for a while now, probably about a little over eight years, actually. I've always been involved in our front-end technology stack, and that started out with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you know a little bit of PHP, but eventually moved on from building products to building what we call product infrastructure. Product infrastructure is kind of the, the systems and frameworks and libraries and things that we build that power the products that we build. And part of that is kind of React, so I got involved in React, you know, kind of before it had a name when this guy, Jordan Watt, created it. And I've been managing that team ever since and, you know, heavily involved in some other things as well. So kind of going back to the very early days, I know Facebook started open source efforts very early in the company's life cycle. There was like the Cassandra database, the Tornado web server, and a bunch of other projects. And so open source 
was important by then and then it's becoming even more important today as you know more and more of the software that we use today is becoming open source mm -hmm. and so as the role of open source increases i think people are starting to have this expectation for large organizations like facebook and microsoft or ibm to sort of play a role in the open source software that the community uses so i'm curious like what motivated facebook to be one of the early movers in their efforts and in, in contributing to open source and being so involved there yeah, I think a primary motivation was the fact that we were such a large consumer of open source software. So even before I joined Facebook, the the stack that we were building Facebook on top of was basically your traditional LAMP stack and all of the technologies, you know, PHP was a was a huge thing that we use and PHP and all the other technologies that we, MySQL and, and all these other things, were all open source. And so, you know, we were motivated to sort of give back, I guess. You know, we're, we're taking advantage of all of the stuff that exists in the community and trying to make it better ourselves. And if we come up with new things, we'll try and, you know, when it makes sense, we'll try and contribute those things to open source as well. Some of our early efforts, like Cassandra and even, you know, even a little later on, I think like Tornado after the friend feed acquisition, I think these were sort of, there was a lot of like server side and low level kind of like back end sort of infrastructure focus for some of our open source efforts and then i would say back in about 2013 we sort of refocused on the front end or started focusing on on the front end a lot more with especially the kind of like advent of react but i think to answer your question you know why do we do this or why did we you know feel compelled to open source technology i think it's because we were such heavy users of open source we always knew we wanted to be able to give back to the open source community. Interesting. That's super interesting. And like, I guess like, especially I've seen a lot of enterprise companies jump into open source and it just kind of makes sense there. But I guess for a consumer facing social media company, what are some of the benefits or, or, or things you get from being in part of the open source community? Yeah, there's a number of them. I think anytime we open source software, it's sort of, forces us to give it an extra round of, you know, almost vigor and try and make sure that it's in good shape. We make sure that, you know, documentation is in order and things work and it's sort of sufficiently decoupled from the rest of our infrastructure and things like that. I mean, one benefit is it just makes our software better, we think. Another benefit is obviously on sort of recruiting and brand recognition. A lot of people who have joined Facebook in the past three or four years site one of the reasons they're really interested in joining is because they want to work at a place where something like react can be created it's not even necessarily just about react or graphql or some of our other open source technologies it's about wanting to work in an environment where you're allowed to share what you work on with the world so that's been a huge thing for us and i think we've also received tons of amazing contributions that have made the software better from external contributors and and it's acted as a a wedge almost for us to be able to collaborate and communicate more with other companies in completely different industries or even in the same industry. So, you know, the benefits of openness and communication are core to our sort of mission as a company and open source enables us to carry that out on the software front, the technology front. Yeah, I definitely want to come back to that point about sure. open source being attractive to hiring new developers. I think that's a very interesting and important point. But kind of taking a step back, you mentioned how Facebook started open source mostly in a lot of the back end database type technologies and then has more recently moved into the front end. So can you kind of give listeners a lay of the land of all the different areas that Facebook has open source technologies today? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> Everything basically. On the software side of things, especially on the front end, we have frameworks for building UIs, we have frameworks for doing data fetching and, you know, big to small, you know, things as large as React and GraphQL and also things as small as like recently we open sourced a single function called the existential function IDX, which is like a very, very small library that serves a single purpose and serves it well. And that's on kind of like the front end sort of JavaScript and, and, you know, side like that. We also have tons of server side infrastructure around everything from, you know, database systems and key value stores to, you know, caching systems and build systems and, you know, editors and, and all sorts of different software on that side of things as well. 
And then we also have projects like our Open Compute project, which is all about sort of open sourcing the specifications and designs for the hardware that we use to power all of our services. So in our data centers, we have, you know, racks and racks of computers and servers. And the designs for those servers are actually open source as part of the Open Compute project. So it's everything from hardware to software and everything in between is kind of the variety of, of things that we open source. And kind of jumping into the team and how that comes together, I know that you're mostly focused on, or like overseeing the React team. So I'm curious, when you're about to, or when you're making a decision to open source a technology, how do you find the right people to sort of kickstart the effort? Well, an interesting thing about the way that we write software at Facebook is the people that author the code are the people that support the code. That doesn't mean just through open source and things like that. It means like when your code goes out to production, you know, if you built a, a user facing product or you built a library or something like that, when your code goes out to production, you are the like QA, like as an engineer, you're on the hook for making sure that your software works. And so the process of open source, something is very similar. It's not like the authors author it and then another team takes over and starts to maintain the open source project. So the key sort of driver for whether or not it makes sense to open source something is, well, one of the key drivers is, you know, are you going to, are you committed to maintaining it as an engineer? If Facebook determines that it's valuable to open source and, you know, we're using it in production and it's working for us, those are kind of the prerequisites. And then this, the, the next question is, are you going to maintain it? Are you going to be contributing you know, to the project and, you know, not necessarily indefinitely, but fostering a community and building up a first line of kind of defense and things like this and getting other people kind of helping and supporting. Because what we don't do, and, you know, with some projects very early on in Facebook's life, we, we did this incorrectly. We would kind of throw things over the wall. You know, you have something and you don't necessarily even open source it. You just make the source code available and people can do with it what they want. But that's not the way that we treat open source anymore. So, you know, I think the question was, like, how do you decide if something is is good for open source? Well, there's another, many other, actually, facets that go into, like, figuring out if we should open source something. But the big driver is, you know, is the engineer motivated to build a community and maintain the project and, and be a good steward of the project? Interesting. So it falls upon the engineer themselves. Exactly. And, if, if and the, the team. Yeah. yeah. And then if the engineer is not that interested in, because, you know, building an open source tool and then maintaining it are very separate things and they're different skill sets too, all together. So if an engineer is not interested in maintaining it, but they want to open source it, is, is it possible for that to still be open source? It's definitely possible. They basically just have to find people who are motivated to, you know, be the, not necessarily just maintainers, but be the folks that are going to, you know, drive for even a small community to be created or, you know, set up an RFC process or, you know, there has to be somebody who is committed to the project or else we wouldn't open source it, basically. It doesn't need to be the engineer themselves. They just are responsible for, you know, finding the engineers that that are willing to kind of put in that, that effort and make sure that we're not just throwing something over the wall. Sometimes I imagine we probably have things that we would consider open sourcing that are actually just reference implementations. And we would say, hey, this isn't actually like a thing that we're going to maintain, but it's a problem that we solved. Maybe our solution is too coupled to our infrastructure, or maybe it's, you know, we don't really want to maintain it as an open source project. We want to continue iterating, but we want to share our solution with the world. That would be like a different type of release if we were to do that. I can't think of any examples where we've done that before, but I could just imagine us saying like, oh, you know, let's not open source it, but if people are asking for it, let's still make the code available. Wasn't GraphQL one of these situations? GraphQL, interestingly, started out as, I mean, it, it had no intention of being open source. It was a very specific problem to a set of problems that we were having with how we do data fetching in our apps. And I think once we started applying it, to React applications, it became kind of a natural candidate for open source because if people are using it successfully alongside React at Facebook, 
that might be an indicator that it's relevant elsewhere. And people were, you know, engineers were generally very happy with using GraphQL plus React. And so at the first React conf in like 2000, what was it, 2015, when we originally released and announced and talked about GraphQL, I think we were a little surprised and overwhelmed by the reception. It was kind of amazing to see it because we had been using it internally for a long time and we knew it was working, but we didn't know that necessarily the problems would resonate with everyone. So yeah, that's kind of one of those cases where you know it wasn't originally designed to be open source it wasn't originally built to be open sourced but it was a, it made a natural you know it was a natural fit it was a good candidate for it after the fact other projects are sort of designed with open source in mind you know from the beginning maybe they'll start out with their source code like on github in a private repository and our intention will always be to kind of eventually open source this i think one project that comes to mind is called fresco an image library for Android that, you know, makes it, makes image rendering a lot faster and more performant and more efficient. And from the beginning, we were like, okay, if we're solving this problem, we have talked to the rest of the community. We know a lot of other people are facing the same problems. Let's go ahead and just set this up so that if it is successful here, it'll be very easy to sort of flip a switch and make it public. So we have kind of both. We have projects that are like, after the fact, we go back. And React was kind of one of these as well. React wasn't originally designed to be open source as well. But when Instagram wanted to start using it and we needed to decouple it from our Facebook-specific infrastructure, it became a good candidate for open source because we'd already done the work to decouple it. And it was kind of a general purpose thing. Mm -hmm. And then other projects, the other cases, no, from the beginning, you know that if this works, you want it to be open source. I would say that that case is becoming more common these days, especially as we hire more and more people who are passionate about open source. You know, everybody that we work with in the open source community, they all assume that everybody is really excited about open source and passionate about it. But it's actually not that. There's actually quite a few people that, you know, appreciate and 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 feel they benefit from their code not being open source and not having to worry about any of the implications of you know, other people being able to try their code in, in ways that they didn't, they hadn't considered. So a very long-winded answer to your question, I hope. For more than 30 years, DNS has been one of the fundamental protocols of the internet. Yet, despite its accepted importance, it has never quite gotten the due that it deserves. But today's dynamic applications, hybrid clouds, and volatile internet demand that you rethink the strategic value and importance of your DNS choices. Oracle Dyn provides DNS that is as dynamic and intelligent as your applications. Dyn DNS gets your users to the right cloud service, the right CDN, or the right data center using intelligent response to steer traffic based on business policies, as well as real-time internet conditions, like the security and the performance of the network path. Dyn maps all internet pathways every 24 seconds via more than 500 million trace routes. This is the equivalent of 7 light years of distance, or 1.7 billion times around the circumference of the Earth. With over 10 years of experience supporting the likes of Netflix, Twitter, Zappos, Etsy, and Salesforce, Dyn can scale to meet the demand of the largest web applications. Get started with a free 30-day trial for your application by going to dyn.com slash sedaily. That's D-Y-N dot com slash S-E-Daily. After the free trial, Dyn's developer plans start at just $7 a month for world-class DNS. Rethink DNS. Go to dyn.com slash S-E-Daily to learn more and get your free trial of Dyn DNS. No, that's really helpful. Kind of taking a step back to the question that we started at, which is like, how do you find the right people? I think React is a good example, right, of one engineer creating it or like inventing it, so to say, and then a whole other team of engineers actually bringing that to the real world and to the outside world. Mm -hmm. so do you want to kind of talk about 
why React was so successful in that process, even though the original engineer didn't necessarily push for it, it still like sort of became what it is today. Yeah, I think the the process for kind of building up the team and finding the right people to contribute, the number one thing that you need is like is optimism and interest and excitement. And so, you know, Jordan showed React before it even had a name. He showed it to a dozen people, myself included, and everybody kind of had the same reaction. Even me, I was kind of like very skeptical. I was like, look, you know, I can see the benefits on the developer experience. I don't know how this is going to be performant enough. I'm really not sure how we're going to apply it to our problems that we're solving here. But, you know, yeah, let's try it out. There were a couple of other people like Christopher Chedeau and Pete Hunt who provided even more optimism, like way more optimism than even I did. And, you know, when you become surrounded by people who figure out, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and, you know, we had a couple of people that just were exposed to this through social connections or connections at work or because of projects they worked on. I think Pete Hunt and Christopher Chedeau both worked on photos at one point. So they kind of like found out about it from, you know, a tie that we had there and they were excited about it and they were interested and they started playing with it. And then they said, you know what, I need to help. I need to make this happen. So I think the the thing that you look for is like you want to bring people onto the team that not only have the right skill set, but sort of believe in the vision and believe in what you're trying to accomplish and kind of agree with it. It's one thing to try and manufacture a team out of like, okay, we need two iOS engineers, we need one C++ programmer and one designer and this and that. And it's another thing to like let the team form organically based on the people that are most excited and most passionate. So that was part of it. I think the, the next wave of team members that kind of came on board were the folks that were excited to be early adopters. You know, not everyone, especially if you've been in the industry a while and you've you've used software that is brand new, not everyone's excited to be an early adopter. And the the great thing about early adopters is they have an exceptionally high tolerance for instability and bugs and, you know, features that are missing and things like this. And so if you can find a team to work with, this really easygoing and willing to work with you and willing to not only deliver their product, but also work to deliver the framework itself, they're going to be your biggest advocates. They're going to be the the next wave of core team members. And so I think consistently, one thing we've done with the product infrastructure at Facebook is we work with a single team first that is going to use the thing that we're building. We never build software in a vacuum. We never build a thing and then once it's shrink-wrapped and finished, give it to anyone. We always build sort of infrastructure or abstractions or frameworks or libraries. We always build them in conjunction with a real user-facing product. And we improve both simultaneously. We make the product better through improvements to the framework. And we make the framework better through feedback from the product and the teams building the products. So the next wave of, of people that worked on React were people that used React early on. And, you know, I think if, if anyone remembers the original announcement at JSConf in 2013, it was actually like, it didn't go well at all. <laughs> like, we didn't communicate well what we were doing. But the people that did hear through that first talk became the next wave of contributors to the project. And one of those people is Ben Alpert from Khan Academy, who is now, you know, he's been involved in in React for a long time. And he is, you know, effectively kind of tech leading a lot of the efforts from Facebook's side. So the next wave of people came from, okay, if you present about this and you get people that are interested enough to sort of get into the code base and hack on it and try and figure things out and, and understand what you're trying to accomplish, that's where the next wave of sort of contributors came from as well. So yeah, I think it, it's it's definitely a process and it varies project to project. But for React specifically, I think it was this idea of this kind of like slow, slow adoption cycle, a little bit at a time, get people to buy in and see it and then commit to it. The other thing that really helped with this was the fact that at Facebook, we sort of We really value like engineering mobility. We don't want engineers to stay on the same team for forever. We want them to share ideas and cross pollinate and move across teams and explore, you know, different opportunities across the company or really across the companies at this point. 
And so it really was easy for a user of React to become a core contributor to React at Facebook. It was perhaps easier than it is at a lot of other companies. And so, you know, when Christopher Chedeau wanted to switch from the photos team to the React team, it was kind of like, I had a meeting with his manager, we set up a timeline, and then it was done, you know, so that has really, really helped with a lot of building team building around some of these open source projects. That's very interesting. And I know that you're, you're kind of getting at the fact that organically building up the team has worked out really well. But if you had to kind of talk about at least a few key roles that must exist for an open source project to be successful, like what would you say they are? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one role that people might not think about early on, especially in you know the development of a project, is like who is going to communicate about it? Who's going to talk about what it is and what you're trying to do and why? You know, I worked with another engineer, a very good friend of mine named Marshall Roach. And early on, our relationship, our working, you know, the environment that we worked in was such that he was significantly better at solving a lot of the hard technical problems. He wasn't really as interested in kind of like communicating about them to all of engineering. And he recognized that I was like more comfortable with that with public posts and with speaking at, you know, all hands, engineering all hands and things like that. And so the partnership that we had was I would sort of like vet, you know, we would, you know, come up with ideas together. I would vet kind of like his implementations and review the code and things like that. But then I would kind of communicate about the stuff that that he was enabling. So that is the only reason that a lot of the work that he and I were able to do together was able to be accomplished. If it was just me, it wouldn't have been able to happen. It wouldn't have been technically the right solution. If it was just him, it might not have happened because it wouldn't have been communicated about actively and proactively and, and efficiently enough. So one role that you absolutely need is somebody who's going to communicate what you're trying to do. And this can be the same person who's writing code. It can be the same people that are you know writing code, but you have to have that role. I, I think that is often overlooked. And the reality of the situation is that as much as the technology that we're building, you know, these are problems of technology, they're also problems of psychology. They are, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, basically communication that has to take place to enable people to understand and kind of give the project a chance and, you know, enable them to kind of like get on board with the vision. The next, you know, set of people I think you need are sort of the folks that are that feel so committed to the project and so committed to the vision, they've really bought into whatever the messaging was, that they're committed to doing all of the things that might not be super glamorous. It's always fun to release a thing, but who's going to respond to issues and stack overflow questions and who's going to email people back and answer questions and all this other stuff. So you need a, a set of people who are so heavily invested in the success of the project that they're willing to do the both the, you know, the actual development work and the, you know, testing and, and fixing and cleaning up and things like that. But also the sort of like, you know, the softer stuff, the maybe sometimes less glamorous stuff of support and, you know, ramping people up and writing documentation and stuff like that. Other than that, I, I really do think every team is is very different based on the technology itself and, you know, who the target audience is and stuff like that. But those are two that I think are are really necessary. Interesting particularly on the first role with the messaging, do you have an example of maybe internally an open source project that didn't do so well on this front and you think that was a, a good lesson learned? Interesting. Hmm. A project that we perhaps didn't message well enough. I think it's, it's harder once we get to the point of open sourcing it, but I can certainly think of a, several examples of internal projects that weren't broadly adopted internally because they didn't have a person who was, you know, doing that communication. And I can think of also, you know, I, you know, one example might be that we haven't really communicated with the community, I guess, in open source as much as kind of flow, especially when we first started out with flow, you know, we were building a thing that was going to work in our environment, but we didn't really have as much of a kind of spokesperson that was very proactive with messaging about what we're trying to do and sort of almost persistent about it. It was kind of like, hey, here's a thing that we're building. It's working well for us. We're going to continue investing in it. And it was almost more of an internal project that happened to be open sourced. And we would, you know, work with the community and things like that. 
But on that project, we might also have not invested enough in sort of like fostering a community and, and answering questions proactively and solving the issues of the community because there are still so many problems just to solve for Facebook alone. Like projects like that, which are open areas of research and exploration and like just truly state of the art in academics, it's really hard to balance like trying to deliver value for both us and the community. So maybe that's one example where we didn't, you know, a single person didn't really emerge to become the sort of, you know, what like Tom Dow and Yehuda are for, for Ember mm -hmm. or what Pete Hunt was early on for React, you know? And so I, I guess that's one example I can think of. Interesting. And then how has that turned around today? Because I know Flow is, you know, increasingly being adopted nowadays. And just for listeners who don't know, Flow is a static type checker for JavaScript, right? Yeah. It's being adopted a lot more recently and especially in the React community. And I think, you know, one of the reasons it started to take off is just because it's just gotten a lot better. You know, eventually this, the technology sort of speaks for itself. But the problem is that that maybe that process took too long because or took longer than it needed to. But yeah, I mean, it's it's been working exceptionally well for us internally. And I'm excited for, I managed the Flow team for a little while. And even though I don't have programming language background or anything like that, I, I managed the team for a while and they're just absolutely awesome, super, super smart. And they've been able to extract a tremendous amount of value out of our Facebook JavaScript code base. And, and I think that just has translated well to other people as well. You know, Uber just announced their Uber Eats app, which is a React Native app, and they also used Flow and some other things. And so it's good to see other companies adopting Flow and it working well for them because the reason we originally built it was just to give ourselves more information about our JavaScript code base. And if it ends up being generally applicable in the long term, that's fantastic. As for what else has, has changed, I think just organically as more people have tried it and gotten value out of it. The hard thing specifically about that project is like the JavaScript community is not only bifurcated amongst the different like type solutions like TypeScript and, and Flow. There's a the majority of people in the JavaScript community don't even don't even yet know why types are valuable. So unless you come from a strongly typed background, strongly typed programming language background or have some experience there, you might not at first glance see why this like it seems like this is more work. Should it be? You know, it ends up really benefiting you in the long run when you have increasing size of your code base multiplied by the increasing size of the team working on that code base. That's when systems like Flow and Hack have, you know, really, really shown their their stars. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Kind of while we're in the process of talking about success of open source project, I'm curious, like, do you internally have any metrics that you use to track the success of an open source project? That's a good question. I think we, we do have dashboards and things to track the health of open source projects. So, you know, if there's a lot of really old, really stale issues or people getting frustrated or open PRs or something like that, we track that kind of stuff. You know, superficially, people track stars in an informal way. They're like, oh, yeah, like we just crossed this milestone. There was like a, a post that we did for React when it crossed – I think it was like 50,000 GitHub stars or something like that. But I think the the metrics that we track that we care about are like meaningful contributions from the community and maybe... And how would you define meaningful contribution? Yeah. So, you know, there's a couple little different levels of contribution and I think they're all amazing. You know, anybody who comes in and just like fixes the website or fixes documentation is is great. You know, especially if they find things that we overlooked or, or didn't find or if they complete some stuff that, you know, isn't, isn't there. But there have actually been contributions from open source that have sort of like, I don't know, pretty meaningfully like affected performance of certain things. You know, somebody submits a pull request and then all of a sudden the, the main Facebook app is faster or something like that. So we track those types of contributions. I think we just kind of like that's one of the ways that we sell the wins of open source. That's one of the reasons that the effort and time and energy that goes into open source is worth it. And, you know, so we track some of that stuff. I can't think of any off the top of my head on the spot here, but I don't think we track too many metrics. I mean, I know we have, you know, internal dashboards and things like this, but the metrics that we care about are, you know, is the project healthy? Is it adding value to people's lives? We track, you know, the, the sentiment and, and stuff around projects. 
yeah. yeah. What do you, th- you know, what do you think would be a good metric for us to track? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one because I think within the GitHub project itself, yeah, there's like hard metrics you can track, like issues and making sure that there's a certain time limit for how quickly you respond or how quickly they're closed or how many stale issues there are. I think those are kind of some of the more concrete ones, but I right. think in general, it's like, the sentiment is hard to is the one that's hard to measure. Like, yeah, I agree. You know, you you've had very successful React conferences. In each year, they continue to get better. But how do you measure that? Right. I really <laughs> yes. Know. What's our net promoter score? I guess is that you know. And there's some things that we get excited about when people do analyses of like how likely are you to use if you've used React, how likely are you to use it again? And like that has a really high percentage, something like over 90% of people say they'd use it again. And we don't track those things, but we certainly like when they come up, we use it as one more input that we're either doing something correct or if they're if they're negative that we're doing something wrong. That's something. And then I guess adoption is good. You know, our intention when we open source software is never to make it become just, you know, oh, we've solved the internet. Like, yeah, everybody in the world uses this. Like we're not even – we don't even have a goal around, for example, like React Native adoption to make it be like this is the only way that you build apps. But what we do with all of our solutions and all of our open source projects is this is a thing that solved this set of problems for us. And if it solves those problems for you, we'd love to work together on it. And so we've had pretty amazing contributions from like Airbnb and Wix.com, for example – on like React Native and doing different things with React Native. And that collaboration couldn't have happened if those projects were were closed source. So to me, like that is the best metric is like the sort of like meaningful collaboration and adoption. Adoption for adoption's sake, I don't think is interesting. I'm really not worried about or interested in every company on the planet using React. <laughs> There's actually like costs associated with that. There's like more support costs and more maintenance burden and all these other things and trying to like make it do things that it wasn't designed to do. But there is, you know, tracking adoption, like meaningful adoption where you're getting input and you're getting new use cases that help you test your hypotheses and you're getting meaningful contributions back. That type of adoption, I think we do track and we do care about. Dice.com will help you accelerate your tech career. Whether you're actively looking for a job or need insights to grow in your role, Dice has the resources that you need. Dice's mobile app is the easiest and fastest way to get ahead. Search thousands of jobs from top companies. Discover your market value based on your unique skill set. Uncover new opportunities with DICE's new career pathing tool, which can give you insights about the best types of roles to transition to. DICE will even suggest the new skills that you'll need to make the move. Manage your tech career and download the DICE Careers app on Android or iOS today. And to check out the DICE website and support Software Engineering Daily, go to dice.com slash sedaily. Thanks to Dice for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to support the show and check out some new career opportunities, go to dice.com slash sedaily. That's interesting. I never thought about meaningful versus not meaningful adoption. And I guess like you're talking about it in terms of like, why wouldn't you just want everyone in the world to adopt React? Is it just too much pressure on the organization? No, I I don't. Well, there's like other solutions to problems out there that are amazing. And like, I don't think that React solves everyone's problem everywhere, nor do I think that it would be as good of a tool as it is if it attempted to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, i I've played with like, you know, lots and lots of other frameworks that are unrelated to React, but that I think, you know, could be influenced by React. But I don't know. I I don't think that, yeah, I I guess there's this tendency to always want kind of more, 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 more influence, more adoption, more subscribers, more stars. Everybody kind of like even tweets about this stuff when they have like a new, it just feels good that you've been validated once you have like a, a kind of high profile client or adopter. But 
I don't think the world would be very interesting if everyone in the world used React. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> I guess like what's interesting is that then there's the other side, which is like the ecosystem is completely fragmented and you have a fragmentation problem. And I agree. Particularly in JavaScript, this seems to be an issue where it's like either like it's just like so many different solutions for the same thing and or do you want one really good solution? And so that's like a an interesting balance to to have. So when I think about that question about the fragmentation and maybe even bifurcation, the concrete downsides of that, in my opinion, are like a less of a willingness to share ideas and like what I would call like siloing and closedness. Right. So if we can if we can solve closedness and like, you know, siloing and and enable more engineers to collaborate, then I think it is a worthy goal to say like, yeah, we want more people using React or using something, anything. If we can find some wedge that gets more engineers that wouldn't traditionally be talking to talk, I think that is absolutely valuable. But I also think that like you do want some amount of fragmentation because that's how new ideas form. If we had just used what everyone else was using when we created React, we literally wouldn't have been able to create React. So you want experimentation. You know, it's not so much like, let a thousand flowers bloom, but it's kind of similar. It's let's innovate independently and then come back together and share ideas and share code wherever we can. And heck, let's share languages. Let's share programming languages. Let's share tool chains and tooling and things like this. It's a very interesting topic because I think as you open source technologies, one thing that naturally happens is people create their own solutions off of what you open source because they need some part to be different. You know, even within organizations, they'll have their own alternatives of React or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so have you thought about how to not only encourage that, but also encourage them to be open about what their ideas are so we can all come back together and create like an even better solution together instead of the silos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really hard problem. Like, how do you get folks whose like livelihood is dependent on them having a better solution how do you get them to share their solution back? I don't know the answer to this, but I think that the answer involves more communication and collaboration and us fostering an environment where we have as much inclusion as possible. One thing you'll notice about the React community is no one will ever bash or complain about any other frameworks or libraries or anything like that. And if they do, you know, they'll be basically, you know, not scolded, but they'll be like reached out to by somebody from the React community that says, hey, that's not cool. We celebrate wins. We celebrate new things that happen, new developments. Yesterday at EmberConf, you know, the Ember team released Glimmer. I can't wait to play with it. You know, we, we should celebrate each other's accomplishments and create an environment where people are more likely to want to share their solutions because they're novel and new and not because they're a strategic advantage for them or a, you know, a strategic sort of source of i don't know proprietary worth yeah if that makes any sense so i think it involves all of us creating an environment where we celebrate the developments of others rather than i don't know for lack of a better way of saying it you know crapping all over their ideas <laughs> you know i basically don't read hacker news or reddit anymore because i can't stand to see people hating on everybody else's ideas <laughs> yeah i totally agree that's interesting. I kind of want to transition off and move into For sure. talking about contributor policies and roles. So this is a very interesting thing for me because I think React follows a more closed core team approach, whereas Ember, which is another front-end framework, mm -hmm. follows a more open RFC type approach. So sure. I was wondering if you can quickly, like in a, in a couple sentences, just explain to listeners what the closed approach versus open RFC approaches and why React has chosen to go with the former and not the latter. Yeah. So real quick, just to compare and contrast a little bit, you know, an RFC approach, I think you sort of accept any type of proposal from anyone in the community. And if it garners enough support, it will be sort of considered for inclusion by the core team. And, and maybe, you know, some RFCs say like, if it garners enough support, you know, it will be included. There's no kind of like discretion. I think the model that React has, which I think you referred to as sort of like closed team or what did you call it? Closed core team. 
closed core team. This is like purely an implementation detail and a side effect of sort of the way that the project kind of grew organically. But I think what you mean there is sort of like the development of the framework is sort of at the discretion of the core team, the people that are, you know, stewards of the project and are maintaining it and working on it. Most of them, I think at this point, probably work at Facebook, although there's a handful of non-Facebookers. I don't necessarily think one approach is fundamentally better than the other. I think at the end of the day, someone needs to have a long-term vision for where the project wants to go in their head. And whether that is a group of contributors, a group of you know, a closed core team or something like that, or it's a single person, you know, a lot of projects just have a single sort of visionary. Somebody has to be kind of responsible for deciding what this should be and what it should not be. It's really hard for people to list out non-goals when they're thinking about planning and things like this. But like, if everything was allowed to be everything, then, you know, our software wouldn't be valuable. Everything would just be, you know, huge frameworks and they would do everything. So you have to have somebody who's sort of in charge of the vision and where we want to go. But then after that, I think the process for like getting changes into the framework or getting changes into the project, that, you know, to me, it's kind of do whatever works. I think the reason that React has the approach that it has is probably because the folks that are investing directly in React, a lot of them work here at Facebook and they're trying to solve real problems for real engineers that happen to also be at Facebook while simultaneously meeting the needs of the community. And so we tend to, while we would happily accept any sort of RFC process and any sort of like proposal and things like that, and we will evaluate it, we tend to like focus on the like roadmap that we've planned out for the past you know, six months to a year, first and foremost. And then the other things, like the other parts of the, you know, anything that else that's suggested is kind of like, oh yeah, definitely, we want to get to this. We'll like add it to our list of things to focus on like in the future when we do our next round of planning. So right now we're driven by like, you know, we have a very specific goal. If you contribute to that goal, it is very likely that your, you know, contribution will be not only like, accepted, but like appreciated very much. But if you're working on something else, it might take a little bit longer to get it in. I don't know if that answers your question about the RFC process versus the closed core team. I guess I it catches me a little bit by surprise because I, I don't necessarily, I don't think we're actively trying to be a closed core team. I think it is just a sort of an implementation detail of how the team is currently structured, but we would be happy to revisit it for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Because I think the RFC process is interesting, especially Ember's. And I'm curious to see, like, I don't know what other projects have that similar process, but it makes it just like, I guess, even like the communication of that makes it seem a little bit more opening, if that makes sure. sense. Yeah, I, that makes sense. I, I think if folks feel right now like they aren't allowed to or aren't able to contribute to React because of its sort of model for development then this is certainly something that we should like. We should definitely consider changing it. I don't think anyone on the core team is actually thinking about this. So I will sort of bring this up with them. But I do love the RFC process, at least a couple of RFCs I've read. I, I haven't read a, an Ember RFC in a while, but there's also, I, I think, you know, the GraphQL team tried to adopt a GraphQL RFC process and seeing some of that stuff is great. We had a, a proposal for JSX 2.0 that I think is still, you know, under consideration and, and we'd love to do when we when we can find the time here. So I don't think it's actively trying to be closed source, but I'll maybe we can make it even more open. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So do you think it's a requirement for companies to dog food their technologies before open sourcing it? Because for example, there's I'm not sure if this is true, but I've heard React Native is, is not used in large parts of the Facebook app just yet. But, you know, it is open sourced. And so, you know, do you think it's a requirement for companies to dog food it first before sure. they open source it? Yeah, it's hard to judge the scale because we have sort of, I don't know, many dozen engineers writing React Native code every day. And we have something like 400 screens across a couple of dozen apps that are using React Native. But because people don't see many apps that are entirely written with React Native and they don't see, oh, the Facebook main app doesn't use React Native in newsfeed, so 
React Native is is not used by them. It's it's kind of a little bit, you know, or maybe our messaging is just wrong on this, but we are using it very heavily internally. But the scale at which we operate, when you have so many engineers, it's like if all of those engineers aren't using React Native, is it being used internally? We have literally hundreds of engineers that write React and React Native every single day. So I think this is pretty critical. I actually think we won't open source something if we're not already using it or if there's like a very special extenuating circumstance. And the reason for this is because we've done it in the past. We open sourced a couple of things that we weren't fully, you know, rolled out on in production. And we were like, oh, this doesn't work. But meanwhile, a bunch of other companies adopted that technology. And then we left them in the dust when we went and pursued something else. So for me, you know, as a manager, whenever somebody comes to me and says, hey, can I open source this thing? My first thing that I'm looking at is like, okay, let me talk to the people that are already using it and make sure they're happy with it. Because if they're not happy with it or they don't exist, the project that you're releasing isn't guaranteed to be maintained. So, you know, a lot of companies will sort of build something first, open source it, and then try and get internal adoption through open source. And I really don't agree with that approach. I actually think this is one of the reasons that our open source projects have been at all successful is because they are relied upon heavily by Facebook. You know, we have 1.8 or something billion users hitting React every single day. And we use a nightly of it. <laughs> so you're pretty, you can rest assured that we're not going to easily break your app because we always have to find an incremental path from where we are to where we want to be because it is in production. So yeah, I sort of feel pretty strongly about this, that I recognize that it should be okay for companies to open source things before they're using them. But I personally won't really kind of allow that at Facebook. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think the particularly talking about the the whole release upgrade path. I think that's super important. And if you're not testing it internally, it's hard to know once right. it goes out in the wild. And I guess I kind of want to move on to some of the lessons learned along the way as you've done open source. So maybe because you're more focused on the React team, what are maybe some mistakes that you made along the way or things you think you could have done better yeah, I mean, one thing we could have done better was like skipped the first talk where we presented what React was and then just had Pete Hunt give his <laughs> his second talk from React Europe. We'll put that talk in the show notes. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, so Pete Hunt gave a talk entitled Rethinking Best Practices. And the title was actually adapted from a tweet that was sort of a jab at Facebook after the initial presentation of React. And the, the reason was like, we just really didn't communicate about the problems that we were trying to solve very well. And people got sort of superficially hung up on either syntax or, you know, the idea that we were going to combine HTML and JSS. Oh my gosh, this, or, and, and JavaScript. Oh my gosh, this is like the worst thing ever. I can't believe Facebook, they've been under a rock for so long. So one thing I think that I would do differently if I could go back and do it again. And maybe this actually, maybe I shouldn't say this because I think as a result of it not being super, not having a lot of people super excited about it, we had this like slow burn where we were able to get a couple of key people on board and make it a lot better before we had to start facing the influx of adoption about a year later. So that's kind of one thing. I think another thing is like <laughs> React was kind of the first project or one of the very first projects from our like new open source regime, if you will. Like basically before that, it was a lot of stuff that wasn't maintained and we didn't really, you know, it was okay and it sat there and, and it wasn't super active. But with React, it was something that we were actively developing and, and making better. And, you know, so maybe I wouldn't change that messaging as much. Maybe it was kind of, <laughs> yeah, look, we announced this thing. Nothing to see here. <laughs> we'll call you in a year. But I would like to have been more open about what went into it. I think we were still learning, you know, as part of this new open source initiative. And I would have liked to be more open and communicate about what problems we were solving. And I do, I, I really kind of like, I, I hate these like very splashy launches that like claim that they've solved everything. And I always wanted our messaging for our open source program to be pretty consistently, hey, here's a thing we built that solves a problem for us. Try it out. Let us know if it works for you. We'd love to collaborate if so. But oftentimes our messaging was probably either not that or, you know, maybe like 
too grandiose or something like that. So one thing is just like making sure our messaging is always consistent and, and our motivations are always consistent. But yeah, communication and sort of being really open about what we're trying to do and, and why and, and fostering a, a more, you know, a community of even more contributors early on, I think would be good. Another thing I think I'd do differently is just like, no one really knew for a really long time how to contribute to React. It's super intimidating. The code base is like kind of hard to make your way through. And we're really improving that with, with Fiber. You know, the new code base is a lot more approachable, even though the underlying sort of architecture is a lot more sophisticated and complicated. Maybe for listeners who don't know what Fiber is, do you want to give them a quick... Oh, absolutely. So the short version is we rewrote React (laughs) and we did so in place. The idea is that we're going to enable more advanced scheduling over the next couple of years of work that needs to be done rather than the traditional model of just, oh, just render everything. So yeah, so we're really excited about Fiber, but along with it comes a new set of, you know, contributors and a new code base and it's fully flow typed and it's a lot more approachable. And so one thing I might do differently is early on document how to actually contribute to React. How do you think in React? Especially since it was a, a such a novel and new concept at the time. There's so much, so many ideas that we now just take for granted. We're sick of hearing about them all day. Like virtual DOM. It's like, please don't talk about the virtual DOM anymore. But at the time, we didn't really document what that meant. We didn't really document what we were going for with that. So I would sort of, if I could change something, I would say like, let's go back and create an environment where it's easier to get new contributors onboarded, especially from outside of Facebook. I would really love to have an even stronger and larger community of actual core contributors, not just around the ecosystem. You know, the React ecosystem is is unmatched. It's amazing. We have so many people building so many awesome things that either work with React or work, you know, for React or on top of it. But I would like to have even more core contributors that are comfortable making decisions on behalf of the framework. And right now, I think because it's just been so intimidating to contribute to in the past, we don't have a ton of core contributors that feel empowered to make decisions on behalf of the framework. Interesting. That's a really good answer to that. And I guess sort of similar in the similar realm of things, kind of going off of some of the lessons you learned. Do you have recommendations or or tips for people or companies that are newer to open source, like best practices or things to avoid or things to make sure you do? Yeah, we touched on a a couple of them, but like one of them is like, at no point should you claim to have solved everything. You know, if you solved a problem and you solved it well and you're happy with it, ask some others to verify it. Work with one single client, right? Find one person whose life you're going to make better. Find one team whose product you're going to make better or, you know, sort of find that first client that's going to help you sort of vet your hypothesis a little bit. And then once you have that, then your messaging, I think all messaging for all open source projects should be like relatively consistent. It's like, hey, we faced these problems, X, Y, and Z, and this thing helped us solve those. Here's the trade-off because everything has a cost. Here's what it cost us. And we believe that this is the right trade-off. Let us know what you think, if it works for you, or if you have any other ideas. So that would be my first thing is like, just stop coming out with the better React or the better Angular or the better this or the better that. Say explicitly what the problems are that you set out to solve, say how you solve them, and then open source your code and offer it up to people that can vet and and help, you know, prove your hypothesis a little bit. I feel like there's a, there's a culture of everybody wants like, a few minutes of fame. They want something to go viral. They want some top post on Hacker News or whatever it is. And, you know, if our messaging was a little bit more, a little bit more humble and a little bit more honest about the problems that we're solving and the trade-offs associated with that solution, I think that would be good for everyone. Another thing is just trying to bring collaborators in early on in an open way and trying to create an environment of like inclusive contributors, you know, and I think most frameworks and libraries and products and and things I've seen that are open source are pretty good about this these days. Yeah, interesting. That's really cool. And one thing that is less applicable to particularly open source of Facebook, but open source in general, you know, burnout and and then abandonment is like such a common theme amongst Mm -hmm. open source projects. And when it's a small one that, you know, you know, one developer put out and, you know, it has 
it's not used by that many people. Maybe it's not a huge issue, but once it kind of grows in popularity, that becomes a huge issue. And so I guess like the, the problem though is that, you know, we're human and we, we like a lot of engineers particularly, they like to build stuff, they like to solve problems, but they're not necessarily into the whole maintenance part of it and the support mm -hmm. part of it. So it's completely yeah. natural for someone to, you know, have found excitement in solving the problem and solving the problem through the open source technology, but then losing interest later on. So how do you kind of manage this within Facebook as, as well as like, how would you, what are some recommendations you might have for just like the general pop, open source community around this? Mm -hmm. This is like very real. It happens absolutely all the time, especially as a consequence of sort of popularity. If you have a project that only a couple of people use and you build a very tight knit, very small ish community and they have a problem, you're probably going to be, you know, once in a while, you're probably going to be motivated to say, yeah, let me jump into that. And we see that often. But once something gets to the scale of, you know, here's an example like Babel. So Sebastian McKenzie, we sort of like, he ended up joining Facebook and his literally the only thing that he was responsible for doing was working on Babel. Not even just for Facebook. Facebook was using it, but just for the community. We'll pay you full time. Just continue working on Babel. Keep carrying your vision out. You know, here's a couple things that are really important to the community. Here's a couple things that are important to Facebook. You know, with the release of Babel 6, I felt like he had a very strong vision for it. We kind of all agreed. A lot of the people in the Babel community agreed with the vision. And then people who started using it, and it required that when they wanted to adopt Babel 6, they make changes to their code, just started being exceptionally unreasonable to him and super mean. And as a result, he just really didn't want to deal with that community as much anymore. And so, you know, he wasn't as responsive on issues as he'd been. He wasn't as responsive on PRs and stuff like that. And so, you know, he just basically burned out from the sort of treatment. And, you know, we very quickly found another awesome set of projects for him to work on. But the reason that Babel continues to thrive and continues to be so valuable today is because it wasn't relying on a single person to maintain it permanently going forward. And, you know, the, the current Babel core team continuing to iterate and improve and innovate. So the thing that you have to do is long before you even are at risk of burning out, you have to build up a set of people that also believe in the project and are going to help you steward it. They're going to help you maintain it and, you know, find a good home if something happens to you. So I don't think it's just about burnout. That's not the only risk. I mean, we also, as a company that, you know, values engineering mobility and engineers moving from team to team, we have to be prepared for like an engineer is just moving off the team that maintains presto or an engineer stops working on hack and so we're constantly bringing new members into the team and making sure they're kind of like motivated and helping and things like that and it's not just about employees either it has to be a community and one like pretty easy thing you can do in order to get people motivated to help out with like closing issues and merging pull requests and answering questions is just recognize them for it. Just appreciate them for it. The first project that I ever like became a core contributor for was called MooTools. We've talked about it in the past. But and like the first thing that happened was the creator of the project thanked me for answering a bunch of questions on the then like PHP BB forums, like some bulletin board forums, where I was just answering questions for people because I'd been through the stuff and I and I knew the answers. And he made me a moderator of the forums. And he said, just wanted to call this out, you know, thank you so much for your help, you know, and, and now you're a moderator and I trust you to kind of like help scale this. And I took that responsibility so seriously, you know, and, you know, I was young and it was my first project and I didn't really know much about open source at the time. But if you find somebody who's adding value, recognize them for it, appreciate them for it, let them make that part of their identity. Give them commit access, give them admin access or whatever, and enable them to, you know, utilize the trust that you've, you've sort of emplaced in them. That's Does that really, make sense? Yeah, no, that's really, really good advice. I think I've heard this from a lot of authors and they kind of just get sick of, you know, doing a lot of work and not getting appreciation in, in return. And I can see immediately how that, how that really affects you emotionally. It's like open source is like 50 or maybe even 100% emotional. There's a huge emotional component to it because a lot of the times you're doing this in your spare time when you can be doing other things. And, yeah. and it's, 
you said something about appreciation as well, and I just want to hit that point for one second. The best way to be appreciated for your work is to appreciate other people for their work. And the best way to get recognition for your work is to recognize other people in their work. And all too often, our default mode is, you know, I'm using a thing, it breaks, you owe me. It's like, look, it was free, the person put their time into it. How about let's reframe this? How about instead of fix my bug, you say, hey, I just noticed that this thing broke. Is there any way that I can help? How about offer up? you know, help and offer appreciation and you will get appreciation in return and you will get recognition in return. These things are side effects. They're not the, they're not the goal. Yeah. And I think there's been some communication recently or like people are being a little bit more open about their frustrations in this area. So I think it's becoming more aware or people at least aware of this problem. I think for a long time, people weren't even aware of the treatment that some of the open source authors were facing. Absolutely. And if you're one of those authors and you're you're getting these like nasty comments and posts and emails, you don't want to like highlight that. You want to just push it down by default. You're just like, oh, I just want to forget about this. But yeah, yeah, it's good that it's being brought to the forefront a little bit more. Yeah, and I think we've we've gone through a lot of the questions I want to go through, but I kind of want to end on a future looking note. So, are there any either internal projects that you're really excited about that are soon to be open sourced, or just like areas of open source technology that you're super stoked about? The answer is yes. (laughs) As to how much of it I'll talk about it. I think I won't get into specifics, but I will say, you know, sort of every year we have our our annual developer conference, F8. Yeah. You know, at that developer conference, we have a lot of engineers come and talk about the things that they've built. And, you know, inevitably some of those things will be public. So I'm looking forward to F8, which is April 18th and 19th this year. And yeah, there's there's a bunch of other things that we've been working on sort of in the open. There's, you know, developments for various projects. There's new things coming to React, React Native, you know, some exciting stuff coming to to GraphQL, exciting stuff coming to Flow. You know, there's there's a lot. There's a lot I could tease without going into specifics. We're not slowing down in any way and if anything, you know, we're we're probably even maybe speeding up a little bit. We have, you know, more engineers building more open source stuff and Lots to be excited about. Yeah, and are there like new areas you're focusing on? You know, for example, machine learning or... or... Yeah, as a company, Facebook especially, you know, in in VR, machine learning, AI, all these things, there's a ton of research and development happening there. I'm a little bit removed from them. I'm not working on any of that stuff day to day. But yeah, keep an eye on the space because there's some really, really interesting and exciting stuff happening, you know, ML, AI, VR and all the other acronyms as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been a really, really fun interview, and I'm sure that listeners will have a lot to learn from. And if they want to contact you, where should they reach you? Yeah, Twitter's probably fine. You know, ping me on Twitter. What's your uh, handle? We'll include it in the show Uh, notes, but... Sure, at T-O-M-O-C-C-H-I-N-O. My last name is pronounced Okino, by the way, for for anybody who cares. But yeah, (laughs) ping me on Twitter. You can also shoot me a message on Facebook. I'm facebook.com slash Tomo, T-O-M-O. Yeah, and this has been fun. It's awesome. I always love kind of talking about this stuff, and I really appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.